Let me get this absolutely clear. Every square inch of quote-unquote white farmer's land, unquote, in South Africa was stolen from the African people by the depredations of white colonial invasion. Every square inch was stolen from the African people. A system of brutish, vicious, racist suppression then followed a long, dark night of racial discrimination, succeeded by the theorizing of that brute repression in the system called apartheid, of separate development, of racial segregation, of pencils being put into people's hair to see how curly it was, of rulers being used on people's noses to see how broad they were, of legal forbidding of white and black people to marry, of the entirely false classification of millions of people as coloreds, not white and not black, the racial segregation leading to District 6 in Cape Town, demolished to ethnically cleanse black African people from their homes. A people's war led by the African National Congress with its military wing, Omkonto in Sezwe, and the mass solidarity movement around the world defeated the apartheid state. The hero, leader of the ANC, Nelson Mandela, walked free from 27 years of incarceration, much of it on Robben Island. The ANC emerged as the government of South Africa committed to land reform, that is, nationalizing the land owned by a tiny section of the white population of South Africa and distributing it to the black people from whom it had been stolen in the first place with ample compensation. Ill-deserved, some think, of the former supporters of the apartheid system. Why do I mention it today? Well, not just because I lived and breathed that struggle, that people's war, that mass international solidarity movement, and not even just because the bovine Donald Trump made a speech about it in the week, imagine. He doesn't even know where South Africa is or anything about its history, except that white people used to run it and black people now do run it and are keeping their promises belatedly to the mass base of voters who have repeatedly elected them. And not just because other fools have weighed in in defense of quote-unquote white people against quote-unquote black racism. You couldn't make it up. But for this reason, I'm one of the only left-wing people in this country who traveled the length and breadth of apartheid South Africa before the system was broken and defeated. I did so under special dispensation from the African National Congress, a cadre of which I remain, and until my last breath, proud to have been. So I've seen it, smelt it. I've even felt the punches of white apartheid police power in the Guguletu Township in South Africa. You can say in a small way, and from my nose, I gave my blood in that struggle. 
And you know who facilitated all of my efforts across South Africa, who provided every rand in my pocket, every dinner on my table, every car in which I traveled, and every tissue with which I dabbed my nose. South African Jewish heroes of the ANC. You see, Jewish people don't have to be with apartheid. The Jewish people in South Africa, in the ANC, small in number, gigantic in stature. Joe Slovo, the leader of the armed struggle to overthrow apartheid. Ronnie Casrills, one of his deputy. Ruth First, the wife of Joe Slovo, murdered by an apartheid parcel bomb delivered to her in Maputo in neighboring Mozambique. Albi Sachs, Dennis Goldberg, I could, I promise you, go on, including Max and Audrey Coleman, who were responsible for my safety whilst traveling in apartheid South Africa. Why do I mention that? Because yet again, Corbyn has been crucified all week in every section of the media. A full spectrum campaign of falsification, distortion, and even downright lies. The idea that the mild-mannered, if he was religious, he'd be a Quaker, a marrow grower, a vegetarian, a vegan, a bicyclist, a man who has stood for peace and reconciliation everywhere and all of his life can be caricatured in the way he is now, not daily, but hourly. Every time I switch on my telephone, I discover an hourly attack based on absolutely false, fake news. Now, Corbyn can speak for himself. I have my own criticisms of him, which increasingly irritate me. He can defend himself, but I will never remain silent as people seek to rewrite history, rewrite the English language, and deliberately distort the things that Corbyn has said in defense of the Palestinian people, not least because the best Jewish people in the world stand with Corbyn on this matter. And they are speaking up with increased volume and regularity and saying to the often non-Jewish partisans, of the Israel lobby in Britain and in the world, you do not speak for me. Uh, if you thought that Corbyn had a problem and there cannot be a sentient being in the land, not even in Ward 5 in Broadmoor, can anyone be in any doubt that there is a full-scale industrialized campaign in the mass media, to destroy the leader of the Labour Party. If there is any sentient being who thought Corbyn had a problem with the media, just you wait to see what happens now that he has unrolled at the Edinburgh Television Festival this week a plan to democratize access to the British media. I haven't, because I'm just back in the country, studied it yet in every particular. But here are my thoughts on the particulars that I know. The idea that digital advance in developed societies should be for the benefit of and under the control of Mark Zuckerberg and whoever owns Netflix, whoever owns these big 
digital platforms is patently absurd. This new digital age has created a public square, and no private corporation can be allowed to decide who can speak in that public square, and neither can they be allowed to reduce these phenomenal advances of human achievement in the digital field to the cash nexus, merely a means of making ever more money. Do you know that the owner of Amazon this year, this year, has become $260 million richer every single day of this year. Just run that past yourself. $260 million richer every day of 2018. Now, good luck to them. As long as they pay their taxes, which they don't, I'm relaxed about Mr. Jeff Bezos. I'm not against people making money from commerce and from legitimate business activity if they pay their taxes, but I'm not going to give them the key and the padlock to decide who else can enter that marketplace, enter that public square. These giants have become too big and too powerful. They should, under any sane law of capitalism, be broken up so that genuine competition amongst them can be maintained. Under capitalism, not socialism. And let me say further, I'm against interference in people's media businesses. I don't even support Jeremy Corbyn's demand that journalists should elect their editors because I saw what happened when the current editor of The Guardian was elected and I've seen what happened to The Guardian thereafter. It's up to The Guardian how they appoint their editors and it's up to talk radio how they appoint their editors. I'm not interested in interfering in existing media businesses. I want new media businesses. And that's the beauty of Corbyn's plan. A British digital corporation, just like the BBC, but better. One which opens an alternative public square to the ones owned by Bezos, by Zuckerberg, by Murdoch, and by the others. Let them run their own businesses. If people choose to continue to patronize them, they will. And fair enough, but let us have a democratic public space in the public square that we, all of us, can democratically access. So Corbyn fired the first shot in Edinburgh in perhaps the most important war that he will ever fight, the war against censorship, the war against fake news hegemony, the war against the absolute domination of the public sphere by people who don't even pay tax. I want to talk about Syria, the long and bloody war to overthrow the existing government in Syria and to change the character of the Syrian Arab Republic from the one that it has and which appears to have majority support within the country to one ruled by ISIS and Al-Qaeda and the alphabet soup of Islamist extremism is coming to an end. A final battle for Idlib, the last redoubt of that alphabet soup of extremism has already begun. John Bolton, in what seemed to me to be an open invitation to the extremists holed up in the OK Corral of Idlib to launch a fake chemical attack of the kind they may well have done 
in Douma, said that any use of chemical weapons by the Syrian armed forces and their allies in the liberation of Idlib will be responded to most strongly by Donald Trump's army. Why would the Syrian government in the last battle of the war risk, never mind the morality, think of the logicality, risk a chemical weapons attack in the last battle for the last town in the war? You may well say they may be bad enough to do it, but they certainly ain't stupid enough to do it. But that doesn't mean it isn't going to be done. The doyen of British foreign correspondents, multiply award-winning Patrick Coburn of The Independent newspaper, joins us now. Patrick, thanks for coming on the show. <clears throat> no, thank you. Summarise, if you would, the state of play as the last city, the last redoubt, uh, is going to be fought for. Well, Assad has clearly won the war. Um, most of uh, Syria is under his control. The armed opposition is really confined to Idlib now. They lost their uh, last bastion in the uh, south recently. And there's a sort of triangle of Syrian territory, which is controlled by the Syrian Kurds, backed by the U.S. Air Force. But there isn't any doubt about the outcome of this war anymore. No, no doubt, uh, except the one I've just flagged up. Uh, was this Bolton just blowing hot air? Or does it presage a willingness on the part of the United States actually to fight to keep a foothold in an otherwise entirely liberated Syria? I doubt it. Um, it might mean that they would do something uh, but to sort of show that they're a power to be reckoned with. But I don't think that uh, they're going to intervene long term. You know, there's a great confusion, I think, when people talk about uh, intervention in Syria. You know, there's been some debate um, this week in Britain about should Britain have intervened in 2013? Uh, should this be uh, examined again? And I think where people go wrong is that sort of launching a few missiles, you know, is a gesture. It doesn't make much difference, uh, although it's often sold as a way of punishing Assad. But really what the proponents wanted was a long-term uh, engagement in Syria rather like Libya or Iraq. But they didn't want to say that because the outcome in Syria, in Iraq and uh, Libya was so bad. Yes, quite. Uh, you would have thought that, uh, that people would learn from history, but neither the politicians, because David Cameron tried very hard to make such an intervention. I was one of those who spoke in the debate, which the government unexpectedly lost. Uh, Politicians don't seem to have learned their lesson, but neither have commentators. Neither The same commentators now bewailing our quote-unquote failure to intervene in Syria are the commentators who demanded we intervene in Libya and Iraq, and look how they turned out. Yeah, I, I find this very depressing. Um, the... Uh, you know, they, first of all, it's a bit childish to imagine, you know, a little bit of involvement, certainly British involvement, but actually anybody's involvement would change the course of the war in Syria. You know, this was a civil war with uh, people fighting hard on both sides. This was never going to be sort of the idea that it was a great popular revolt with, uh, uh, with all the Syrians on one side and Assad on the other was always uh, you know, um, absurd. Uh, so it would be just like Iraq and, and Libya, an intervention in somebody else's civil war. To have any effect, it would have to be long-term. Britain and America would have to 
be engaged full time in that war. And um, so really this idea that somehow an opportunity was missed and so forth, it's juvenile and it, you know, it, uh, it shows extraordinary ignorance of what the real uh, political facts on the map were at the time. Now, few people know uh, Syria better than you. I know a little bit uh, about it. My characterization would be this, that Syria is a police state like all other Arab states. Uh, it's authoritarian like all other Arab states. Uh, the, there's no way of knowing how many people genuinely support uh, Assad and his government, but there's a pretty good way of knowing that the vast majority of Syrians would never accept living life under ISIS and Al-Qaeda and the plethora of other Islamist groups. Isn't it true that Syria is a developed Levantine Mediterranean society with nothing in common with the caves of the Tora Bora, which you also know well? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when I'm in Damascus, you know, you find people who are supporters of Assad. You find quite a lot of people who don't much like Assad. But what they say to me and uh, to many others is that if the alternative to Assad is ISIS, uh, is uh, al-Qaeda, then they'll stick with him. You know, and this has been true for five or six years. Um and hasn't changed to this moment in time. So, you know, this is the decisive reason, one of the decisive reasons why the opposition lost, that the armed opposition never presented an attractive uh, alternative to Assad that would give people a better life than they have already. What will happen now? Um, the final battle, let's assume that it is bloody but decisive. I think both of those are likely. Um, what happens then? Is there still a commitment on the part of the Assad government in the various uh, channels that were opened up, particularly the Kazakh one, uh, for political reform inside the country? Or will it be to the victor, the spoils? I think um, it's going to be winner and loser because when you have a war of this ferocity, the appetite for uh, compromise uh, is very low. Uh, you know, leave aside for the moment whether the uh, Ba'ath Party type regime ever is ever really going to share power with anybody. But, uh, you know, there's so many uh, people have been killed with such a degree of hatred that I can't see uh, any uh, compromise emerging. There's also a great, you know, for compromise, you need a balance of power, and you don't have that at the moment, that Assad has won. You know, the armed opposition, as we just discussed, is confined really to uh, one small area of uh, Syria. And if you don't have that balance of power, those on the winning side, on the Assad side, are going to say, well, why should we compromise? Should, why should we share anything with them? Now, finally, and I'm grateful for your time, you wrote a wonderful book uh, about these uh, characters. Uh, you uh, analyzed ISIS uh, peerlessly, and I've interviewed you. you before about that. So you're in a good position to hazard a guess, at the very least, an educated guess. What's going to happen after their surely imminent defeat in Idlib, to ISIS? Well, um, they, you know, they have some resources left. They are a fanatical cult. Al-Baghdadi, their leader, is still alive. They don't have much territory left. Um, what will they do? Well, they'll look abroad to some extent to other places where they might... Uh, um, have uh, strongholds, and they'll look for opportunities. Um, you know, in Iraq, in Syria, will there be uh, splits in the government? Is there some outside support they can get? They'll hope that you know, divisions will open up uh, that somehow they can exploit in order to stay in business. 
And also, you know, even when they're on the back foot, you know, these guys, you know, they, um, they came into a, um, a Druze uh, area in southern Syria um, the other day, you know, and massacred over 100 people, one of the biggest massacres in the, uh, in the history of the war. So they still have the capacity to do great damage. Patrick Coburn, thank you, as always, for joining us. This is the mother of all talk shows. Now, let me read some of the sea of correspondence coming my way. This from Abner in California. Can you believe that? Hello, Mr. Galloway. I've been studying you for over five years and consider your, you heroic. Your blistering attack on the U.S. Senate is what legends are made of. I'm currently attending your class at the University of the Airwaves, which is online live in California at 11 a.m. on Fridays. I have learned a lot from you over the years, including that Damien is a legend, Norma is a sweetheart, and Ken from the Highlands is a coward. My girlfriend considers you Shakespearean. I had feared Talk Radio UK executives simmered you down some, as if. But your last radio show was one of your best. You have certainly crossed the pond with Jimmy Dore and the irrefutable Norman Finkelstein. This is the pulp non-fiction more people need to fear. And he adds, P.S., for an accurate view of U.S. politics, check out Webster Tarpley. Thank you very much indeed for that, Abner. Very beautiful words. Uh, John says, It seems that your friend and SNP colleague Alex Hammond is in a wee spot of bother tonight, George Galloway. How the mighty have fallen. That's from John in Aberdeen. Not sure why you think he's a friend uh, of mine, and I don't have any colleagues in the SNP. Um, Alex Hammond, no doubt, will fight these accusations that have been made. My guess is that Salmond is a pretty doughty fighter. Gary says, ooh, talk radio with George Galloway, nearly missed it again. And Dakota, my old friend in the United States, who's just had a little boy, him and his wife, and the little boy, as you may know, has been called after me. It's Friday morning in Portland, Oregon, and I'm sitting in hospital with my wife and son, and we're preparing to listen to my new son's namesake, George Galloway, on Talk Radio. We're happy to share this moment with the world. And, Mr. Galloway, we stand with you, brother. Hashtag proud dad. May God bless that child, and may you always be pleased with him. Random Gildersleeve says, time to tune in to Galloway on Talk Radio. Indeed it is. And my old friend Marie McFarlane says, settled and ready to listen to Galloway on Talk Radio. So tune in for some truth and uncensored contributions by all of us. Hashtag change the media. That's the Corbyn hashtag uh, on the subject I talked about in my opener. District 6 was a former inner city residential area in Cape Town, South Africa. Over 60,000 of its inhabitants were forcibly removed during the 1970s by the apartheid regime, says John Locke. And Peter says, Mr. Galloway, are the establishment doing a Julian Assange on Alex Salmond, the next First Minister of Scotland? Peter in Glasgow. I don't really want to get into it, Peter, because the police are now involved. So best I leave it uh, at that. Fra says, George, I hope Corbyn hears of your unstinting support for him as the rest of the MSM vilifies him. You have kept the faith and, like Corbyn, stand by the truth. Thank you, Fra. JBW says, oh, what have I missed? I'm late here today. Well, you'll probably want to listen to the talk-up. Lars Svensson says, I like Jeremy Corbyn's plan, but only if this new platform will be open to foreigners as well. I would seriously miss interfering in your British business. Fra says, rumours circulating of a proposed false flag gas attack in Idlib as the West rallies to defend its prodigies in rebel-held Syria. Once Idlib returns to Syrian control, Syria may find a semblance of peace, finally, from Western intrigue. And Fergal Leddy says, David Lammy joined the Twitter chorus today against Jeremy Corbyn by claiming 90% of British Jews were Zionists. Can this be true, George? Well, I'm not sure why you're surprised about David Lammy. He's 
actually a, how shall I put it, robust supporter of Mr. Netanyahu's Israel. 90%, yeah, quite possibly. It'll, it'll be high. A high percentage of British Jews uh, are supporters of Israel, but a very significant minority, if not numerically significant, intellectually, morally significant minority of British Jews are not. And Subu99 said, just returned radio to talk radio to listen to George Galloway on moats, had turned into, had tuned into a local radio station to escape attacks on Jeremy Corbyn, but to no avail. Really sick to death of all these smears, attacks, whatever they are. So hoping for some sanity from George. Hashtag Corbyn. And Hassan says, the difference is that Iraq and Libya have oil. Syria just has sand by comparison. Uh, he goes on, off topic, but I'd like your thoughts on Howard Zinn's historical perspective on U.S. history. A titanic perspective, it is gigantic. And Chris says, Corbyn seems to be suffering the same witch hunt as Trump. Anyone, it seems, who doesn't conform to liberal center ground now will not be tolerated. Can't think of any comparison between Corbyn and Trump, but let's take a break. Well, we will if you call us, and if you have a different point of view to mine, your call will be prioritized, 0344-499-1000. We also prioritize women callers here because we don't want a men-only university. And first-time callers, of course, also very welcome indeed. All calls, in fact, 0344-499-1000. You call us, we'll call you back and put you on the radio, so it needn't cost you more than a penny or two. You can also email me via the website at talkradio.co.uk and you can text me, text the word TALK followed by your message to 8722. But that'll cost you 25 pence plus normal charges. You can tweet me, of course, for free at George Galloway at Talk Radio. Now there's a doogie on the line in Wolverhampton. There is another doogie calls me from eastern Beirut. Is it the same doogie? Doogie, welcome. Yes, it is the same one, George. You're welcome. Nice welcome back to, to Blighty. Nice to speak to you again. And you, my friend. Yet the point I'd like to make regarding Jeremy Corbyn, the way you're sticking up for Jeremy Corbyn. Yes, I am. So you agree with Nick Griffin then, because he's been sticking up for Jeremy Corbyn on Twitter. Well, you know, I looked at a car downstairs and saw that it had four wheels. Uh, I'm not responsible for anyone else who makes the same deduction. So uh, that's a pretty puerile point, Dougie. You must have, I, I you must have better than that. No, you you think, must have better than that up no, your sleeve. No, no, George, I don't think it is puerile because if Nick Griffin backed anything that you keep, if he agreed with anything that Nigel Farage said when he was in charge with you keep, the media would have been all over it. And you know that yourself. I don't even know why you're dredging up this spent fascist Nick Griffin. Well, is that, the, is that really the best you've you. got? Is he's that really the best you've got, Dougie? Is that talking. all you can say about I'm Corbyn, not. that Nick Griffin no, no. agreed with him? No, I am asking if you... you He's endorsed what you are saying now well, on the radio. I, well, I, you're telling me he has. I, you're, you're telling me he has. I've no way of knowing the accuracy of that. I don't give a toss whether he thinks my car also has four wheels, as I have deduced. That I, doesn't invalidate my conclusion that my car has four wheels. I think you are trivialising it, no, George. No, look. If it, was any, if it was against Nigel Farage... It would be all over the news. Well, all I'm, over, and you know it, George. Well, I, I'm not normally. You know I'm not normally parading aid uh, for attacks on Nigel Farage. I'm usually paraded as his uh, collaborator in the Brexit campaign. So no, I'm not no, sure your metaphor works with me, Dougie. Now, now what I'm saying to you is, George, if Nick Griffin had have agreed with anything that Nigel Farage said Why don't regarding we, the yeah, Jews. Okay, okay, you've made that point now five times. Uh, can we talk about what the point actually was? What is this point that uh, that you're taking uh, exception to? 
Well, bye, bye. I, I, I ain't taking exception to any of it, George. All I'm asking So you agree is, with it? You agree with Corbyn? No, I don't agree with it. What I'm well, tell us why is, you don't agree, then. What don't I'm just, asking look, you is... Don't write on your knuckles uh, uh, what you imagine to be a bullet point and then stick to it, repeat it over and over again. Yeah, you you, you must have a point of view. You haven't answered me. You must have a point of view on what it was that Corbyn said that I stuck up for and that Nick Griffin, you say, has, you say, endorsed. I you must have a point I, of view I, on I, it. I am not saying that he has endorsed it. He has endorsed it. Oh. All right, you say that. I have no knowledge I'm of that. I'm not saying that. Go on Twitter. Look at Nick Griffin. I can't go on he Twitter. I'm indoors. presenting a radio show. He has indoors. I'm talking to you, you on the radio, saying. so I can't go on Twitter. He has but let me, let me, for the sake of argument, accept that he has. Now, what's your problem with the point involved? I'm just asking you. Have you got no you? guts, Dougie, now that you're back from eastern Beirut stroke western Jerusalem? Do you not have the guts to stand up for what you actually believe in. I always stand up for what I believe in. Well, then George. tell I'm us. Just... I'm inviting you. You've got a national, indeed international, audience. Right. Waiting I'm... with bated breath Are for you your always... black country vowels. Are now, go ha... ahead. Are you happy to have Nick Griffin condone well, what you are spouting on your radio show tonight and what Jeremy Corbyn as, says As far as I know... No, I'm going to stop you there. I'm going to stop you there. As far as I know... Nick Griffin has not endorsed anything he that has. I have said he has. on my radio he's, show. He's, he's endorsed. Well, this is now Jeremy guilt Corbyn by this is now guilt by association. This is now guilt by association. The favourite weapon of every smearer and witch hunter in existence. I am not just smearing. Tell, I am well, just tell me what you object to to what Corbyn said, or have you has the has Wolverhampton captured your tongue. Oh, you're yeah. usually a big, big talker I've when you're on the phone from West I Jerusalem. Am, no, I, all I am asking is, you're asking me. I, ain't, I don't disagree with what Jeremy Corbyn has said. That's fine, then. Thanks very much. No, thanks, 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 thanks a lot. On, you, thanks a lot. You, Dougie in Wolverhampton doesn't disagree with what Jeremy Corbyn says. That is newsworthy. I'll grant you. Apparently, it's Hodges. So yesterday, that's Dan Dan, the Corbyn man. So yesterday, the leader of the Labour Party received support from both Nick Griffin and David Duke in the same day. But that's the new normal now. So this weekend, Labour members and MPs will just shrug and be back out on those doorsteps. Dan's getting a bit desperate, you see, because not least on this show, he predicted a, a, a mass walkout of Labour MPs to form a new party. But it seems, if Choco Amona was not being disingenuous in the newspapers today, that uh, Chuka, the putative leader of the coup, the walkout, isn't going to walk out. He's here for the duration, unless he was being disingenuous in the newspapers today, heaven forfend. And therefore, desperate Dan's prediction on this radio sh station, multiple prediction of this walkout may actually end up embarrassing him again, yet again. If there was a prize for the man who predicted most things wrongly in any given year since he came to journalistic prominence, Dan would run away with the prize. We did ask him to come on the show tonight, but he is busy. Mark Webster says, George, I'm confused. During last year's election, you stated on the Richie Allen show you no longer support Jeremy Corbyn. Therefore, I find it slightly hypocritical of you that you constantly berate people who don't support Corbyn when you yourself threw him under the bus <laughs> during last year's election. That's me. I'm famous for not defending Jeremy Corbyn. In fact, I'm the famous throw Corbyn under a bus guy. That's me. Mark, dear God. Um, uh, da -da. Yeah, the communicipalist, one of our finest correspondents, says, in my view, the MSM's attempt to destroy Jeremy Corbyn has backfired utterly and destroyed the credibility of the corporate media industry in Britain. Moats is now the only MSM output I ever listen to or interact with in any way. 
Thank you. And David Leviscont says, Gigi, I don't agree with your guest on the point that Syria is a civil war. I don't think so. It is full of bloody hands of the West and their dirty funds. Well, these are not mutually exclusive, of course, David. Um, there were plenty of Syrians in the civil war on both sides in Syria. But it was also an invasion of dozens, scores of other countries seeking to change the regime in Damascus. Let's hear from Lizzie Fletcher, who is now running Tony X, the protest board's new social media platform, Ticket, T-I-K-K-E-T, -E which I myself have joined, though not used yet. And Lizzie is the boss. Lizzie, welcome. Hi, George. How are you? I'm very excited by this uh, project, and I'm glad you've uh, come forward to talk about it. Why don't you describe it first, and then I'll ask you some questions. Well, well we've all been having problems with social media. Uh, lefty news agencies, they battle corporate influence, having to buy... Craig Murray, Craig Murray's complaining his stuff's all been removed from Facebook. Jimmy Dore's stuff is under attack. Exactly. Uh, the oh, Empire Files of Abby Martin being taken off the air due to sanctions. There's no doubt that although they started with the right-wing nutcase, uh, what's his name, Alex Jones, yeah. uh, that it's swiftly moved on to closing... Uh, other left-wing opponents of the prevailing orthodoxy. Who, whoever it is that they've closed, it's it's never good. I, I don't think it's good, and I don't think you think it's good for open debate. You know, to have anybody shut up. I mean, so what we need, fashion. what we need, is a thousand flowers to bloom. We need, exactly. we need a thousand Facebooks, a thousand uh, Twitters, and that's what you and Tony have done. Tell yeah. us how it works, would you? Yeah, well, uh, it works on a similar platform to Twitter. Um, it's it's quite similar in layout, and it's very easy to use. It's t i k k i t dot co dot uk. Just put that in your search engine and come along and join us. And uh, how many people are currently on it? Are you in a position to say that? Well, not many. Not many, but they are a very favoured few. Independent Media UK is in the in the throes of joining, so that means Evolve Politics, Squawk Box, the Canary, Unity News. They've also all been attacked recently by the by the big uh, digital owners, the hegemon hegemony of of the people I talked about earlier. That's right. And we're also hoping to be part of the public services that Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Party is going to implement. And I'm quite excited by Corbyn's uh, media plans, are you? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. It's really what we need, opening it up so that people like Ticket, the platform, can have public funding because, really, Ticket is the public. You know, I mean, if... If everybody who is on ticket owns it, I don't own it. Tony doesn't own it. But you and Tony started it, and all people have got to do is join it and use it. Yeah. Um, so r really the thing you lack is marketing, uh, publicity for the existence of the product. Yes, which is why I'm talking to you tonight. Yeah, well, uh, you took the words right out of my <laughs> mouth, uh, I must say. Um, I, I joined it right away as soon as it uh, came to my attention. Thank and you very uh, much. I will And I will use it. I'll go on using the others because I've got almost 600,000 followers on Facebook and uh, almost 300,000 on Twitter. So I'm not going to abandon those platforms, of but I'll definitely not. start using yours too. Yeah, that's right. It's the same as you use Patreon and yeah. you're on RT. I think you know, that's what we need, eggs. isn't it? We, we mustn't have all of our eggs in one basket. Absolutely not, no. We must. And in, in a few years' time, when, when Ticket is uh, exactly the same as all the other platforms, you know, high-profile, part of a public, publicly produced service, under Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Party, then we'll all be quitting, won't we? We'll all be winners because we own it. Have you got a website? No, 
I think so you should. I yet. think you should set one up so that what you've just explained to me can be explained uh, on a website or on a Facebook page uh, until they close it down, <laughs> which uh, they might well do because it's a very interesting, exhilarating new possibility, That's and right. I look Don't forward to it's many, only many a more. Few weeks old. Ticket T I K K I T. Did you say? Dot co dot uk. T i double k i t dot co dot uk. Lizzie Fletcher in Gloucester, and Tony X, the protest board, my prodigious and wonderful correspondent and publicizer of the mother of all talk shows like no other. I'm grateful to you. Now it's always interesting to see what's out there. This is from Fenton on Twitter. It's wonderful to see a trans woman like George doing so well and setting the world to rights. He's an inspiration to all of us in the confused community. Go, Sister George, with the truth-telling hat. I'm rumbled. Fenton has rumbled me. Let's go to Washington, D.C., where Lee Stranahan, a regular, a friend of mine, a radio host, a man who makes brilliant documentaries, a man formerly associated with Steve Bannon, and Breitbart News, a man who knows what's going on inside the Beltway. I want to talk about Donald Trump's position today. Lee Stranahan, welcome back to the show, my friend. Thanks, George. Appreciate talking to you, my friend. Now, um, if you view it from here, from this side of the Atlantic, Donald Trump's entered now his last days, and that the net is rapidly closing in on him. Is that, first of all, true? Well, that's the way the media is portraying it here, too, uh, to some extent. But it, there's a few things going on. First off, his uh, performance, particularly in terms of the economy, is actually quite strong. Now, that, that, that's, that's not debatable by the numbers. Uh, in other words, uh, we, we just are entering the, the biggest bull market. It's been nine years uh, since since we had a 20 percent drop in the market. Uh, unemployment is low. All those numbers are looking quite good. The, uh, the the situation that happened this week was you had Paul Manafort, his former campaign manager, who was tried on 18 counts, uh, found guilty on eight. But it should be pointed out that none of those counts, none nothing there had really anything to do with the Trump campaign. Uh, that it, Even if you take those uh, guilty verdicts at their face value, which I, I tend not to, but even if you do, they don't have anything to do with the, the situation at the Mueller was supposed to be investigating, which was Russian collusion. And it's actually the same thing with Michael Cohen, the president's personal attorney. But the other thing you have to realize here is that I, I think there's something – wider going on and this isn't uh i i'm a, i was a trump supporter that being said i don't agree with everything he, he does for instance he shot missiles into syria after he fell for the uh the duma attack uh i don't agree with that for for example uh, uh forgive me not the the good i forget there's been so many false flag attacks in syria i forget which one it was no it was duma it was duma it was, it was duma okay yeah. But you, you, you understand my confusion. Uh, all the false flags have, have confused me a little bit. Well, there may uh, be another one coming along in a minute. Uh, in uh, Idlib, uh, John Bolton seemed to presage such a thing in his warning to Syria uh, just this week. Well, let me tell you what's going on with Bolton right now. And, and I actually, because as you know, I'm an investigative reporter as well. Bolton is in Ukraine today. And among the people he's meeting with are the ambassador, Ambassador Charlie from Ukraine. Uh, I broke news this week on my radio show here in the States that really flips this whole Russia narrative on its head, which is I spoke to a whistleblower, a Ukrainian, and this guy is not pro-Russia, not pro-Putin. He's a He was part of the Madan. He worked in the prosecutor's office, and he worked in the embassy, the Ukrainian embassy here in Georgetown in Washington, D.C. 
He was approached in 2016, and I did an interview. I've been trying to interview him for a year. This was not reported by me originally, but it was reported by Politico, which is a, an establishment, mainstream uh, political source. They reported back in January 2017 that a DNC operative, a Democratic National Committee operative named Alexandra Chalupa, was colluding with the government of Ukraine. And I've been trying to interview this guy for a year, and he's been hesitant to, to come out. Well, I finally uh, was able to convince him to talk. And I did a 50-minute interview with him, and it's very clear that not only – because he was, he was spoken to in March of 2016. That's before the Trump Tower meeting, before, uh, before the Russians even are alleged to have hacked anything, even if you buy that narrative, before they're alleged to. She came uh, to him. She was introduced by the ambassador at Oksana Schuller, who's the number two at the embassy, and – they said, work with her, and they said, don't talk to Donald Trump, and, and she said, this is a quote, this is what he told me, and I have it all on audio. She said, we're looking for dirt on Donald Trump and Paul Manafort. This is a woman who was obsessed with Paul Manafort for years, and this has been uh, documented by people like Michael Isikoff, the reporter. So uh, I think – what's happening and we and we've just started to get traction on that story but that really paints a very different picture that what happened was the democrats in this country had a plan to get dirt on trump and try to associate him with russia uh worked with the ukrainian government and don't forget this is the ukrainian government of course that the u.s effectively installed after the Maidan. we know that the u.s was involved in that coup and whatever you think of yanukovych uh, and 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 he's clearly a, a mixed quantity, by the way, as as are many Ukrainian leaders. But the U.S. fomented a coup, installed a government, uh, got, took a democratically elected leader Yanukovych, helped force him out of office, uh, and then using those people and those organizations, tried to defeat Donald Trump by setting up a false narrative about Trump-Russia collusion, while at the same time, they were actually colluding with Ukraine, including the ambassador that Bolton's meeting with today. Fascinating, so fascinating yeah. stuff. Yeah. And now, it, look, again, Lee, way, Lee... 100%, uh, 100% proven, George. Yeah. The possibility of Trump pardoning Manafort is something that's in the media here today. Is he likely to do that? Does he have the power to do that? And what would be the consequence of doing that? Well, first off, he 100% has the power to do it. The president uh, has the power to pretty much pardon anyone. You could see that going back in Watergate with when Gerald Ford came in, the first thing he did was pardon Richard Nixon. Yeah. Right. So, so again, right or wrong, that's the power that the president has. Now, will he, will he, uh, Pardon Manafort. I will tell you, I hope so. I think that the prosecution of Manafort was political. And that's not to say that he didn't uh, do anything, although I'm not convinced of that. But here's what it is. Take a look at Cohen, for instance. They literally raided his lawyer's office, grabbed everything. You know, we have attorney-client privilege here, right? Yeah. And the other, thing, the other thing you have to realize, we have a different system in the U.S. and the U.K. in the sense that we have plea deals, right? I don't think you have those in no, the U.K., correct? No. Right. So a, a plea deal is uh, – this is why the federal government has a 99.9 percent conviction rate in federal courts because what they will do is they will threaten you with everything. They'll, over, they'll overcharge you. Right. And then they do that knowing that you'll be so frightened that they'll get a plea deal, basically. And so that's one of the problems, uh, I, I think, in the in the system here is what is what's going on is Mueller, who, by the way, is connected to what I just said in the Ukraine, because Comey's behind that as well, uh, through something called the National Anti-Corruption Bureau of the Ukraine, which is run by the Department of Justice in Ukraine right now. Um, this is clearly a political prosecution to me, to my, to my way of thinking. I, I could prove it. 
uh, it's a political prosecution. So I actually hope that Manafort gets uh, get, gets pardoned. Now, will Trump do it? I don't know. The problem is, let's talk about the stuff Trump's been saying about Jeff Sessions lately, our Attorney General. Here's a question. Why hasn't he fired him yet? Why has Trump not fired Jeff Sessions? He's clearly been unhappy with him. And I think Trump is, uh, quite frankly, a bit rattled. He's a bit scared. He's told by people, including people who are close to him, I- I'm not a Bolton fan at all. I think I think Bolton... Uh, uh, is a very bad guy, and uh, I'm deeply concerned that he, Mike Pompeo, the Secretary of State, Nikki Haley, there's a number of people in the Trump administration who I don't like and don't trust at all. They're neocons, and I don't like or trust them at all. Uh, that being said, he's been I, – I think here's the, here's the broad question. Does the president, any president, Obama, Trump, I don't care who the president is – do they really run things, or is there something greater than them, an unelected force like the CIA, for instance, who really runs things? And I think we're learning right now in the U.S. who's really in charge. And unfortunately, it's uh, unfortunately or unfortunately, it's not really the electedly. I think it's unfortunate it's not an elected person. So whether you whether you like Trump, don't like Trump, like Obama, don't like Obama, there's a big question right now. I think in in America of who really runs things. Now, um, if he, let's speculate, if he pardons Manafort, might that trigger an impeachment motion with some traction? Well, so let's talk about that, because impeachments, uh, again, this gets into some boring technical stuff in the U.S. political system, but impeachment doesn't mean much. What I mean by that is we saw it with with Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton was right. There's, there's a process of impeachment. You need three, three quarters of the, of the Congress of the house of representatives, right? That's very difficult to get. And even the charges right now against him, for instance, the campaign finance, even the thing that, that they're alleging right now, oh, there's a campaign finance violation and so on and so forth. That's generally not enough where it's going to be, okay, that's it. In fact, nobody's ever been thrown out of office through an impeachment. Nixon, they threatened impeachment, he resigned. Clinton, they went through the impeachment process, and again, Bill Clinton finished his term. I think the only other person was Andrew Johnson, maybe, if I remember my history right, but it, it, it's some time ago. So even the impeachment uh, specter that they put up, it, it's very, a very, very, very unlikely, unless there's something else which, again, I don't believe that there is. I believe there's something else they're looking for is they want Russian collusion. They want, uh, you know, they, they they want proof that Trump and Putin were working together somehow or something like that. And it's just not true. And that's why, see, with Manafort, what they were trying to do was to get him to what they call flip, right? Yes. They wanted him to flip. They wanted to overcharge him, and then he's going to spill the beans. But there's no beans to spill. On what they were really looking for, there's no, there's no there there. So, uh, and, and we don't have a system where presidents of the United States are tried for something like starting a war. <laughs> right? no. That's cool. I, no, no, that, that, that's a common or garden. That's right, exactly. So, so the, the the stuff, the stuff that I think you and I would agree should be impeachable. Uh, Iraq, for instance, or in the, you know, if invading Iraq. There was never a hint that George Bush was going to get in trouble for that. Not not a, not the slightest hint whatsoever. And so, uh, you know, if, if you compare what Clinton was in fact impeached for, which was effectively committing perjury, lying, right? That's that's what it was. It was more. It was less the affair, it was more the perjury. Mm-hmm. Uh, or and what Trump's accused of here, which is uh, covering up an affair he's alleged to have had. Which uh, let's grant it. Okay, probably did have the affair. Uh, these aren't the, these aren't the, you know, no people were killed in the affair with Stormy Daniels. So when we have situations like Syria or Iraq, where millions are killed, that's never going to get you impeached. So that's the system we have. 
Lee Stranahan, we'll keep abreast of it, uh, if you'll forgive the pun, and I hope that we can talk to you again soon. Lee Stranahan, the legendary Washington-based investigative journalist and radio host, talking Trump. We're talking Trump as we frequently do. We're talking Corbyn as we frequently do. We're talking South Africa as we do less often, but it's in the news, and Scott Fury in Glasgow is on the line on that subject. Scott, yes. welcome to the show. Thank you, George. Always a pleasure to speak to you. I'm, I'm a, a product of apartheid South Africa. I won't sort of bore you and, and whoever's listening, which is millions, uh, too much with it. But uh, my mother uh, was Cape Coloured, or classed as Cape Coloured, uh, living in Cape Town, uh, South Africa. Uh, she, moved, uh, sorry, she moved in 1949, um, 1948, as we know, apartheid come in. And uh, she had to live a four-hour return train ride from her white brothers and sisters. Um, my nan, my mother, aunties, uncles, in uh, 1949, we moved, or they moved, so the family could be together and moved to England. Um, so, really, a little bit of background about me. I mean, Interesting, I've, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I've been political like, all my life before I even knew what politics was. And I felt anger all my life before I could even correctly pronounce the word angry, you know, so... Um, furious by name, furious by by, by temperament. By, by well, but by, by influence. Yeah, not not. You know, I don't choose to be that way. No, of um, by name. Me neither. Or, I'd love life to be a breeze, yes. but it just ain't. It just ain't. No, and, and the reason I'm ringing, uh, um, you know, a, a family member who has nothing but my best interests at heart. Now, I, I run a, a tour company. It's a one-man band, really, um, and I, I drive some very famous bands about. Um, and I've, I've recently taken to tweeting some political stuff. And uh, a family member said to me, look, it's n probably not a good idea, you know, to retweet some of your tweets, um, some political stuff, because I know that the music industry has been wholly taken over by the corporate industry now. I mean, all, all the, the festivals have been bought up by the usual suspects. The, the, the venues have been bought up. Um, and then they attach their own ticket touting, industrial ticket touting companies to them. So the whole thing now is, is banking, really. The whole, whole music industry now must, may as well be run by NatWest. Yes. In, in fact, even like Leah, the, 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 um, you know, a lot of the stadiums are called after banks now. It's just ridiculous. You know, they, they've completely hijacked what used to be left wing. Now, I mean, I, I'm not um, even, in my view, t uh, retweeting or tweeting something that could be seen as left-wing or, or socialist. This is humanitarian. i am just had enough. And I, I, say I was born hangry, really, without even knowing it, yeah. um, about what, what's well, been there, happening. Well, there's much to be uh, angry about. Now, Indeed. Trump has waded in, as only he can, to the land reform process in South Africa. Do you, mm. with your background, uh, agree with my thesis that actually all the land in South Africa was stolen? from the African people yeah, and, no, no, and, and expropriated by the white settler regime that then constructed the whole panoply of apartheid in order to protect themselves from the democratic power of the people. And now oh, the yeah. ANC has a mandate for land reform and they're carrying out. What's wrong with that? <laughs> it's, it's basically just taking back what was rightfully the Africans in the first place. I mean, you, you could go back a certain amount of years to do that, who knows how many uh, in, in different scenarios, but th there's no way at all that the land is. It's, I would say the same with the Falklands. I mean, you know, is, is, does the Isle of Wight belong to, to the Argentinians? I don't think so. It would be a bit crazy, wouldn't it? <laughs> a very good point. <laughs> a very good point. You I'm know? not sure if that territorial claim has been made. Those well, stranger yeah, it, it, territorial it, it, claims have been made. <laughs> yeah, but it, it's as crazy as that, really. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, my, my point, the reason for ringing is that I'm, I'm kind of worried, to be honest. Like I say, you know, I'll drive some quite well known people about I won't say their names, obviously. Now, you know, what's your view on that, George? That I'm now, I'll be honest with you, you know, I'm, I'm 51 years old and, and, you know, I don't try and be a hard man or say I'm this and that. So I'm, I'm a bit worried, really, because the person who, my family member who advised me, you know, to, to, to lay off the political stuff with, with my business tweeting, mm. I, 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 my gut instinct, my head says, yeah, agree. My heart says, well, if I do that, then I'm betraying, you know, my mum, you know, and... It's, it's, I can't even put it into words. It's very difficult well, for me. Well, my to... view would be uh, that you must be, uh, above all, two 
to thyself. You, mm. even, you, even though you, that may be that people will, will not employ me. Well, you see, I'm not sure. First of all, if, if you take me, for example, mm -hmm. I, I have millions, literally millions, of followers on social media. So being on my timeline, I, I, I being don't. retweeted <laughs> by me, yeah. uh, doesn't sound to me like a bad commercial uh, deal. Mm. Uh, I mean, there are lots of people who could benefit from being a correspondent of mine. But whether yeah. it was the case or not, you have to, especially at 51, if I may say, and I'm older mm -hmm. than that, you, you know, we don't have an unlimited time on this earth. If, no. we, if we live our lives hiding from our own consciences, mm. uh, what would be the point of such a life? We're yeah, going to leave I, I, it. I, I, Without uh, a business, without a penny in our non-existent pockets, mm. we're going to leave it in a shroud. So should we leave it with people thinking Scott Fury in Glasgow stood up for what he believed in, didn't hide from what he believed in, stood up for justice? I think that's a far better legacy than a few extra quid in the bank, if indeed it would cost you a few extra quid. I give you an example. I won't name uh, names either. Okay. We had uh, a very, very big, I'm talking mega big person on our yes. side in the uh, one of the great campaigns in recent years, uh, out marching with us against war, mm -hmm. uh, who had to, that person explained, withdraw after okay. just a few days and not come to the press conferences not come on the marches because in the music business there are many powerful people who wouldn't agree with what that person was saying and doing and identifying with yes and i asked that person very very rich person how rich do you need to be you are proposing withdrawing from something you started because of fear of financial consequences look to your conscience yes and i, I didn't I, see I that do, person again for many years yes until I, recently they came up to me in the street and warmly embraced me so perhaps i got through in the end yeah that's my I, advice scott fa thank, thank above you above all else to thine own self be true that's how i try anyway to live my life scott fury in glasgow an interesting uh, interlude I thought that was. We're going to be talking South Africa with MacDonald Lewanica, a doctoral researcher in the Department of Government at the London School of Economics quite soon. So we're not leaving the South Africa issue. Tony from Stirling says, George, how bad do you think the attacks on Corbyn would be if he does become prime minister? Will the hostile media be too impotent by then or will the volume simply be turned up? Not sure how you turn this level of volume up. And uh, Subu99 says, you have to respect that George Gallery on Talk Radio has the most interesting and knowledgeable guests. Patrick Coburn on now. Daniel in Adelston is up next. Daniel, welcome to the show. Oh, hi, good evening, George. Good how evening. are you? Yeah, good, thanks. No oh, magic. Um, no, I was just going to... This thing with Corbyn, I mean, obviously, you could do... Were well, you doing a show every day... Uh, it would always be about how he's getting battered. Yes. Um, but no, more to the point is, I think all it is is they he he's just a buffer. They're using the Labour Party as a buffer to not let anything happen other than the government do what it wants. Because all the while there's this this nonsense about him apparently leading the SS or something. You know, no one's going to think anything of him. And all the while. I hear yesterday Sky said £3 billion has been spent on the Brexit negotiations. So somewhere along the lines, £3 billion has just been spent on people talking. Um, I, doubt if that number, I doubt if that number can be right, but I, I, don't, I didn't Sky, see... It was on Sky, I couldn't really? believe it. He dropped it in there. Yeah. He, he said, you know, his cost, it was oh, yesterday when Dominic Rab done his rabbit in. Um, yeah. oh, again, it's not my words, I, I don't do that. Yeah, I don't do that. I mean, maybe well, three look, million, but even so, yeah. is this money? Can can I? Can we get money for talking? No. Um, and um, yeah, no. It's just like he's all the. It's the distraction. 
because all this obsession about what he's doing or defending him, the government are just cracking on. Yes, so, and nobody talks about it. Nobody's holding no, the government no. to account. They're no. all too busy holding the opposition to account. But yeah. it's so transparent that I wonder if it's begun to backfire. Certainly, the polls have not moved uh, a scintilla. And but in the, the actual polls, the in by-elections, no, in, in, in local polling. government by-elections, Daniel, uh, yeah. Labour is doing remarkably well and the Conservatives are doing remarkably badly. The Liberal mm -hmm. Democrats are doing quite well too. So it doesn't appear to me that it's working. Uh, but it's maybe no, it's trying. not working because they're, they're trying too hard because it's been one smear after another and endlessly repeated. And one of the points Corbyn made in Edinburgh is undoubtedly the case that though fewer and fewer people are buying the printed media and they're going out of business quite fast, the television and radio bases its output on what is in the newspapers. So, for example, yeah, yeah. on Sky News, every night, and I mean every night, it's like going on to a comedy, uh, uh, the, the Comedy Gold channel and finding only only fools and horses on all day and all night, every night. That's what it's like. Uh -huh. Sky uh -huh. News oh, yeah, has yeah. 15 minutes every single night on the anti-Semitism issue. Now, uh -huh. you, I mean, either you believe that Corbyn is a thinly disguised SS group and few. No, 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 because a couple of years Europe. ago, he was, he was, they were mocking him for just making jams and that. Exactly, so, they you know, mocked him. Yeah, they you... mocked him as a, as a supply teacher, as a yeah, supply yeah, yeah, geography yeah, teacher. Pro buy a proper suit, buy yeah. a proper suit, yeah. and all this not. But so, now, now again, he's not... got a, a black SS uniform in yeah, his uh -huh, wardrobe. Uh -huh, uh -huh. It, it uh -huh. is so ridiculous. And it's, yeah, in, all, I think, credible. increasingly well, threadbare. Uh, so no. my feeling is, I might be wrong, um, I was wrong once. I think it was 1973, 74. I might oh, be no, wrong. Don't, don't, uh, don't but, put yourself but, down, but, George. But my belief is that it isn't working. And so more of the same of it isn't likely to work either. As the great, uh, greatest, I would argue, Jewish man uh, of the millennium, uh, Albert Einstein said, a good definition of madness is doing the same thing yeah. over and over again and expecting a different result. Daniel uh, in Adelston, thanks very much for your call. Well, that's Alex Salmon. Should we take that jingle off for the duration? No, he's not been charged with anything. 03444991000, that's the number to call. The Red Resistance. George, the worrying thing about Jeff Bezos is not just the disgusting amount of money he makes without paying fair tax. It's the fact that he also owns the most famous broadsheet in America, and he sits on a Pentagon board. What could possibly go wrong? I'll tell you what, a point I didn't make earlier, but Bernie Sanders has just made, that thousands of Jeff Bezos' employees are having to live on food stamps because he's paying them so little wages, whilst becoming $260 million a day a day richer. What could possibly go wrong indeed? Tony says, Hi George, the dirty tricks brigade of the deep state in the USA and the UK have one thing in common. They're hell-bent on deposing Donald Trump as president of America and they're going full throttle in the UK on making sure that Jeremy Corbyn never becomes prime minister. Do you agree, Tony from Leeds? I do actually uh, agree, much as I despise Trump, I despise his enemies even more than I despise him. There's no doubt at all uh, that a coup against both of them is underway, and it is an utterly anti-democratic coup. Bob Justice says, hunts all over the media, telling the nation our relationship with the Saudi regime stops bombs going off in Britain. I take it he isn't on the mother of all talk shows tonight. Brings up an interesting question. Would Britain have been safer if he stuck to exporting marmalade. Was he? Was Hunter a marmalade man? I know that uh, Pike, uh, I thought that was funny during the week. Don't tell him your name, Pike! 
Yes, Private Pike, our Defence Secretary, was ridiculed by his own officials in the Ministry of Defence for his idea that we should mount guns on tractors and one or two other zany ideas that he was coming up with. Certainly makes irregular warfare uh, even more interesting. Salman says, I wouldn't be surprised if Jeremy Corbyn tunes in to the mother of all talk shows. You may say that, Salman. I couldn't possibly comment. Tony X, the famous protest board, says the white settlers of South Africa will use the same pathetic excuse as the white settlers in Australia, denoting the land as terra nullius, nobody's land, and they'd be just as wrong. Indeed, Tony goes on, we all knew that Doogie was in the West Midlands. He was fooling nobody, not with that West Brom Wolverhampton accent. <laughs> I think he actually was from time to time in West Jerusalem. But anyway, uh, he's not against what Jeremy Corbyn said about Zionism. We had that from his own mouth this evening. Lizzie says, hope you enjoy this, Hot Legs Helen, the literary hookah, fumed when her memoirs won the booker. A Trump supporter, she rolled her eyes, demanding instead the orange prize. Lizzie, that is actually very good. Now, Eva, uh, the uh, working class poet, uh, who's also a regular listener. She's also a poet, don't you know it? But that's a good one, Lizzie. Let me read it again. Hot Legs Helen, the literary hookah, fumed when her memoirs won the booker. A Trump supporter, she rolled her eyes, demanding instead the orange prize. Very funny, very good. Georgie says, we don't have to agree with everything Corbyn says and does. We can think for ourselves, contrary to what the MSM and the usual suspects from the Parliamentary Labour Party assert. And that's Georgie with her shaved head that she did for breast cancer with her colleague from the Labour Party last weekend. Mal says, George, is it true that a Russian defence military video says that more than 63,000 troops have received combat experience in Syria, flown over 39,000 sorties, and destroyed over 121,000 terrorist targets, killing over 86,000 militants. If this video is true, what do you make of these statistics? Is it then alarming that Russia seems to be levelling Syria to a wasteland, and when does it stop? That's from my old friend Mal in Belfast. First of all, I know nothing of these numbers. You know more than me. I... I'm too busy to watch Russian defense military videos. But when the history of this period comes to be written, the West's involvement in Syria will come to seem like the worst thing that we ever did. And the role played by Russia in defeating ISIS, Al-Qaeda, and all the other Islamist fanatic, head-chopping, heart-eating maniacs will come to see, seem to be the best thing that they did since the anniversary that falls today, the anniversary of the momentous victory of the Red Army over the Nazi Wehrmacht at Kursk, the greatest tank battle in history. And this from Darren Thompson. The more the mainstream media smear Corbyn, the more the many will support him. More and more. The public clearly are not the fools they believe we are. You and Jeremy are my absolute inspiration. Thank you, Darren. Um, this from uh, Ota Benga. If you're going to ask people to ring in, at least let them speak. Daniel could hardly get a word in edgeways. Daniel could hardly get a word in edgeways. He's a regular caller. Why don't you call Mr. or Ms. Ota Benga? 0344. 499-1000. And if you call Ota Benga with zero followers, zero followers on Twitter, I promise I'll definitely let you speak. Richard Red Star says, George, I'm worried. Your earlier caller suggested Nick Griffin agreed with Corbyn, thus implying something sinister. I once agreed with Cameron over the findings of Bloody Sunday when he said, quote, you can't defend the indefensible, unquote. 
I can assure you, George, I'm no Tory. Now we're joined by MacDonald Lewanika, researcher at the London School of Economics, on the story we've been discussing this evening of the land reforms in South Africa and the caricature of those reforms for which the government has a democratic mandate as somehow a theft from white people and somehow a kind of reverse racism in the former apartheid state. I've no idea uh, about MacDonald's point of view, but I'd love to hear it. Uh, MacDonald, thanks very much for joining us. Uh, thanks for having me. <clears throat> now, um, the thesis I'm advancing is that all the land of South Africa was stolen initially from the African people, the clue being in the name. Uh, the African people's land was taken by white settlers, invaders, who took that land, uh, farmed it for generations, making themselves extremely rich in the process. They then formed an apartheid system to defend their ill-gotten gains, to protect themselves from the democratic majority uh, if uh, there had been no apartheid. And the ANC had to fight a long war to break their apartheid system. And part of the program of the ANC was to redistribute the land to the African people. That's my thesis. How does that sound to you? Well, I, I, I think it places the issue in its, uh, <clears throat> in its proper historical context. Um, that that historical record is uh, is, is is correct, uh, but but I guess that the, the issue that uh, a lot of people are grappling with is is, is 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 at what cost are we trying to to to, to revisit this history, and what will be the cost of uh, of, of dealing with these long-standing issues that are there? But otherwise, the historical record is correct. Uh, land was stolen from the Africans; it was appropriated um, during colonialism without uh, compensation. And, and, and indeed, uh, a reverse uh, of that situation is being attempted. But, but really, the question is on the economic impact, the social impact, uh, the impact on, uh, on property rights, the impact on future investment in South Africa. I think that those are the issues that people are grappling with now, uh, in as much as the history that you have articulated and that you have ordered uh, is correct. The ANC have been in power uh, for, what's it now, getting on for 30 years, yeah? Um, and they haven't done this yet. Why are they doing it now? Is it President Ramaphosa coming to office that uh, has uh, has sparked this issue alive again? Well, I, 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 I don't think that the issue was dead uh, at all. Um, and and, and uh, uh, it, it would uh, be giving President Ramaphosa too much credit to say that it is because that he is now in office that this issue is, is, is being handled. This is an issue that predates uh, his ascent into the presidency of South Africa. Uh, if anything, a lot of people believe that the ANC is actually reacting to political pressure, uh, especially from the economic freedom uh, fighters who have been <clears throat> very big pushers of this particular uh, subject, actually a more radical version of, of what the ANC government intends to do now. So this is a question that predates Ramaphosa, but um, to his credit as a politician, it is something that uh, he is engaging and trying to do with it's, 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 it's only uh, to save the skin of the ANC. But what is clear is that there has been popular sentiment around the land question uh, from the days of the, of the apartheid regime. And then and, and the question why now uh, is answered in, in two respects. One, the political pressure from ordinary South Africans and also political formations in South Africa like the EFF uh, explains that. The second is, is political moments. I, I think that we all know that the the, the 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 coming of independence into South Africa was not an easy thing, and 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 time uh, needed really to be placed between the apartheid past and democratic South Africa for people to be able to deal with issues such as inequality on the land uh, in an un unemotive uh, manner that 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 preserved life, but that also saved the economy and did not appear like uh, immediate reverse racism uh, at the onset of democratization in South Africa. Um, the, in my time in South Africa and in the struggle uh, in supporting it, uh, I had a lot of comrades, some of whom uh, are now obscenely rich. And this has left 
a vacuum which the EFF is filling uh, remarkably vibrantly. Uh, its leader, uh, a particularly eloquent man, though of suspect character, uh, his <laughs> opponents say. Um, the failure of the post-liberation governments to markedly lift the economic situation, the social situation of the black majority uh, is beginning to cost the ANC uh, a great deal, uh, potentially even electorally. Um, is this therefore, uh, I think you imply, or inf I infer from what you say, this is the real driver, that the ANC has to show progress on changing the lives and the balance of wealth and power in the country. Yeah, I, I, I think definitely that is one of the imperatives. Uh, it is definitely not the only one. I, I think that we cannot uh, uh, minimize the subject and say that it is a political reaction to the ANC's uh, interest on continuing to hold on power, uh, to, to hold on to power. Because as, as, as to extent, even though they have had some electoral losses, especially at local government level, there's very little that has threatened uh, the ANC's uh, overall hold on power in parliament. They still enjoy a healthy majority, despite the popularity of uh, Malema and to, despite the gains that the Democratic Alliance itself has made. I, I, I think that it is important for us to, to, to acknowledge that there are very real social uh, and economic justice issues that, as you correctly uh, uh, located, are historical in nature and which need to be addressed. Uh, land inequalities in South Africa are very, very stark. And, and, and uh, the land audit that was carried out by the government shows just how stark this is. Um, the land, uh, less than 4% of, of, of the African population uh, on the land, whereas uh, over 70% of the land is owned by white people. I think that at the end of the day, these disparities do need to be addressed. The question really is how do you address them in a way that ensures that South Africa doesn't go the same way as Zimbabwe in terms of economic collapse, uh, that it doesn't go the same way as Zimbabwe in terms of uh, uh, investor flight and, and, and other things like that. But these are legitimate issues that are there and are not just a political action by the ANC government to, to fend off opposition. They are leg legitimate concerns uh, which do need to be addressed and are historical in nature. And in, in brief, uh, Doctor, because we're coming to the end of the hour, um, what are the main arguments being used by the white farmers and their political voices in South Africa against what the ANC government is proposing? Well, I, I, I think that the, the, the biggest um, uh, uh, <clears throat> line of attack on, on this initiative by white farmers is around uh, the respect of property rights. So, and, 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 and this indeed has, has animated the conversation globally because the perception has been created that pro private property rights are under attack uh, in South Africa as a result of this move towards expropriation without, uh, with, without compensation. But, but uh, like I said, I think that th the question goes beyond that. Even though there are uh, some property rights concerns where this issue is concerned, uh, it is still an issue that can be resolved through concerted conversation among South Africans and stakeholders around how they can be able to address the, the historical imbalances that exist on the land uh, in a way that does not totally destroy the, 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 the property rights regime uh, in, in, in South Africa. And I think that that conversation is ongoing. The ANC itself, uh, I started a conversation uh, and, and, and they're trying to put in place a plan that that, 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 that stems the impact uh, of this expropriation on, 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 on private property. Actually, the president did an op-ed, I think, a day or two ago, where he was uh, saying that this is not an attack on private, on, on private property rights. What remains to be seen, or whether that is true or not, uh, is a matter of detail. And that is one thing that the ANC has not placed on the public record. How exactly do they want to go about this in a way that does not impact negatively on private property rights in, in South Africa? The second line of, of, of March are the economic concerns. If property rights are under attack in South Africa, what does this say uh, to investors in South Africa? How safe are other business holdings? If, um, if land can be taken away, will you need? Again, this is something that uh, uh, can only be resolved through the ANC articulating a plan that can be critiqued, uh, that is known 
and at the moment that uh, that, that that itself is is, is is not known. The biggest challenge, however, for me, where, where this is concerned, uh, is, is that uh, interventions, for instance, like uh, President Donald Trump, uh, are beginning to arm uh, those who are interested in a more radical. Uh, perhaps even more racist uh, encounter with the land question in South Africa. And I think that that, that in itself is a, is a powder cake that, that needs to be managed properly. Um, so, so you think so, Trump's intervention may have backfired? Yeah, yeah I, I think definitely. It was, you see, and, and unfortunately, no one likes interference. I think that this is a, 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 an issue that is important to South Africans. And when someone tweets uh, the way that the president did in a way that uh, does not acknowledge in, in, in the first instance uh, that the traditional and historical uh, challenges that you articulated in your thesis. Uh, to be that, fair, uh, he's probably blissfully unaware of it, MacDonald. Yeah, well, which, which is unfortunate. But if you are blissfully unaware of the situation, then the best thing to do is to, 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 to take your right to remain silent. Yeah. You, know, you are allowed yeah. to do that. Well, he might do that in the court soon enough. Dr. MacDonald Lemonica, researcher at the London School of Economics, thank you very much indeed for taking us on that tour of the land question in South Africa. Alex McGuigan in Belfast says, George, I'm still incredulous how a Labour Friends of Israel MP, Ruth Smith, who took part in the televised lynch mob who went after lifelong anti-racist Mark Wadsworth, can pose as an anti-fascist and head up a supposed anti-racist NGO, Hope Not Hate. Furthermore, as a Zionist and head of this NGO, how is this tenable when it has now been revealed? It has been her fellow ideologues who have been bankrolling the far right in the UK, Tommy Robinson Hopkins et al. And this from Padraig Burke, listening from Dublin. Love hearing what Mr Galloway has to say every Friday. Thanks for that, my friend, and to all my friends in Dublin and in Ireland, North and South. Christina says, Dougie does not disagree with what Corbyn says, but thinks it's wrong because it is a point that right-wing Nick Griffin agrees with Corbyn and Galloway on. Does Dougie now accept that although left-wing and right-wing do not often agree, they do sometimes agree? Well, David Cameron described Gaza as the biggest open-air prison on the planet. I wholeheartedly agreed with him on that. And Red Level says, Lee Stranahan on talk radio right now, top-notch U.S. investigative journalist. Listen in and follow his work. And Mark says, Labour should focus on the far right, not Jeremy Corbyn. And Russell says... Did I hear JC wants to amend the BBC's gold-plated funding? That's a red rag to a bull, isn't it? Decades of palatial existence at the corporation and its chosen stars. No doubt it will redouble its efforts into making sure that Corbyn never gets to be PM. It's the mother of all talk shows. The gutless coward, remember him? Uh, he sends an SMS. Uh, in fact, he sent... Several pounds worth of SMSs, spending his wife's housekeeping, listening to every word that I say, and spewing out his hatred anonymously. You hate Trump's opponents more than you hate Trump. Think you've been spending too much time with knighted right-wing Brexit billionaires. Let me tell you what I tell you every week, gutless coward. I don't know any billionaires. To the best of my knowledge, I have never met a knighted right-wing Brexiteer. And so your three-line tweet is balderdash. Now, let's hear from Andrew in Edinburgh. Go ahead, Andrew. Hello, Andrew. Good evening. Can you hear me? I can hear you now. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, good evening. I live near the airport in Edinburgh. Uh, thank you. Good evening. Um, what it is, is it's very interesting that people like yourself, and I've noticed people like the Canadian, that, and the left wing. People who? Who, a, who? Who did you say that? The left wing. People like yourself, the left wing, is finally seems to be pushing through in the media. You seem to be... Uh, I'm a Labour supporter all my life, and certainly a Corbyn supporter. I'm an ex-soldier as well. And what's interesting is now that 
people like yourself and that finally seem to be getting the, the mainstream as such. You seem to be finally there. Well, there's not many of us, Andrew, in the mainstream. Only me, I think, and only three hours a week. Uh, sure. But uh, the point is, uh, we're proving, and that's why I'm still here, that there's a market for us. There's a big following for an alternative point of view. Uh, maybe running into many millions. So uh, it's partly market driven. It's partly a vindication of capitalism, if you think about it. Uh, this uh, show is on this platform because a lot of people listen to it and it's a commercial radio station and that's good for business. But it's also partly that we can create our own media now, isn't it? Uh, it's the existence of this huge audience that people like me have got on social media and all on various new platforms that are coming on stream. No, I absolutely agree. I mean, obviously, I watch him. I'm a left winger, a proper left winger, and I'm glad we caught him. I'm also an ex soldier, which is unusual, but there's a lot of ex soldiers who there are. There is. A, I met some serving soldiers, Andrew, recently, some of them quite high ranking, who sidled up to me and told me how much they support my point of view so you're not uh, you're not alone in that no sometimes it feels like but it's interesting people like you know i do watch um you know you've got people like the canary and all that and it's interesting i read the normally nine times out of ten i've got the garden the times for two points of view but but i'm finding i'm changing that but what's interesting is i noticed that the left wing really this time certainly under corbyn it's what a total change um, and, and you know, it's nice to people like yourself and the show and all that because sometimes you feel a bit annoyed because it's sometimes it's the same news night and all that. I saw you a couple of months ago when you were on the Andrew Neil's program in the in the afternoon on the Daily Politics. So, yeah. you know, I, you know, that was doesn't was happen brilliant. often nowadays, Andrew. Uh, I've lost uh, track of the last time I was on the BBC. Yeah, it was a couple of months ago. You were you were on Andrew Neil and he was talking, he was actually sorry. You were doing, uh, I think it was this week program, one of them, and he was quite polite to you. He was quite, you know, he wasn't. Um, he was talking to you about Corbyn. Well, we we, we are both ago. we are both Scottish after all. So, uh, he, I, I must say, a lot of people hate Andrew Neil. I don't. I like him. I think he's the best uh, journalist on the BBC. He's mean to people on the left, but he's mean to everybody. He's mean to people on the right. And some of the most ferocious uh, attacks upon the right uh, on the BBC have come mm. from him. But uh, I, I hate to tell you, but it was a lot more than a couple of months ago. And in fact, uh, it's been 15 years since I was regularly on the BBC and on Sky. I no longer remember the last time I was on Sky. I even offered for you're free. You were only on a few months. It might have been last year, a few yeah, months. You were on exactly. the BBC program. Yeah, yeah. No, it was. It was and last Anthony year. Was sitting yeah. on that couch. Yeah, it was last it was year, brilliant. I think, or or very early this year. But he, I, I offered Sky News that I would come in and review the papers for free, and they didn't even get back to me. So they're paying people to do it, but they don't want me to do it for free because the paper review has a clear political purpose. It is a 15, 20-minute rant against Corbyn every single night. Oh, no, definitely. I mean, you know, and, and, and it winds me up because you can, you know, every day. But I think it's backfiring now, especially now with the, the anti-Semitic problems. There are issues, of course, there are. No one's going to doubt that. But it seems to be backfiring now. If you, I talk to my friends in Edinburgh and you know, my ex-soldier friends and all that. And mm. it seems to be about fan. People have had enough of hearing that Corbyn's a racist or an anti And it seems to be this London bubble. You come outside the London bubble and most uh -huh. people are like... That's very That's interesting. It. That's very interesting, Andrew. I I'm really uh, glad to hear that. Thanks very much indeed for an excellent call. Russell says, did I hear JC? No, I've done that one. Uh, Richard Rosillar says, I'm enjoying listening to another excellent mother of all talk shows with the incomparable George Galloway on talk radio. Anyone with an interest in current affairs who has an open mind and an appreciation of intelligent, informed discourse should definitely also tune in. Me, dinner is on hold. Richard, I'm really touched by that. Brilliantly uh, expressed. Dakota, my pal in the United States, in Portland, Oregon, says... Uh, I'm listening for the last hour 
and looking at baby George at the same time. And all I can think is, I'm proud I've chosen to name my firstborn after this honourable man. Thank you very much indeed for that. It's an honour for me. Chris is in Colchester. Let's hear from him. Go ahead, Chris. Hi, George. Hi, I'm mate. actually up north at the moment. OK. <laughs> Tell us. So, um, well, well, yeah, no, I drove up here today and I, I pulled over um, listening to the London radio station and uh, feeling like I had to defend Corbyn. Um, but I'm kind of getting fed up with doing it and I want him to defend himself. Yeah, me too. Uh, c- because uh, this will never end. And, you know, if I was in that position, or I'm sure if you're in that position, you, you, you would say something because you've got you've got the cameras of the world on you. And, the, yeah. the you know, look, even Donald Trump... Well, I did himself. it at the Senate. You, you, you turn yeah. defence into attack. Yep. That's what you should have done from the beginning. This yeah. rope-a-dope strategy that he uh, adopted... Uh, like Muhammad Ali against George Foreman in Kinshasa and Zaire, as it then was, uh, only works if you're Muhammad Ali. And yeah, Corbyn isn't Muhammad Ali. No, and they're not George Foreman, unfortunately, and they're not <laughs> tired. And no. they'll never get tired. No. So, uh, they, they he should work. have been on the front foot from the beginning. Uh, anti-Semitism, yeah. like all forms of racism, are completely unacceptable to me, and I've always fought them. Anti-Semitism has a clear definition. It's, it's about 12 or 15 words in the Oxford uh, Dictionary. It is hatred, bigotry, discrimination against people of the Jewish faith. And if I ever see any of it in the Labour Party, I'll crush it with uh, absolute and ruthless determination. Next question. No, I'm sorry, I've already dealt with that question. I'm sorry... Don't keep asking me the same question. I've already yep. dealt with it. That's how he should have handled this. Yeah. D- it's just... You I, know I, the I guy, actually... you mentioned the London radio station there, Chris. Yeah. O'Brien on the London radio station said, today I think, I saw it on Twitter, that uh, Corbyn's media proposals were interesting, but he couldn't trust them because Corbyn has no tolerance for dissent. Well... If a statement could be the absolute opposite of the truth, that (laughs) is that statement. Far from having no tolerance for dissent, he's allowed the dissenters to punch lumps out of him hour after hour, day after day, year after year, without lifting a finger against them. Yeah. I mean, and then you've got O'Fogarty afterwards, Sheila O'Fogarty, it's just... It's a terrible radio station, and uh, it's but, dreadful. It's dreadfully know, boring, apart but, from anything uh, else. Yeah, but what I just wondered—you uh, talked about South Africa earlier, and I know the, the history, but and I, I don't support uh, the murder of white farmers now because some of them wouldn't have had anything to do with the apartheid. Oh, of course, uh, murder but, is murder. Uh, Whoever, whoever's doing it and whoever's suffering it, we must be against yeah. it. It's a it's but, a sin as well as a crime. Yeah, but I just wonder. I mean. You know, there's apartheid in is in Palestine now, but I'm sure when you were fighting against apartheid in South Africa, you didn't have people accusing you of being anti-white, did you? What a, what a very good point. <laughs> what a very good point, Chris. Thanks a lot for that great call, mate. And drive safely. Uh, this is from John in Manchester. I've been telling my teenage sons for quite a while that the talk, John from Manchester. Sorry, I didn't understand that. I've been telling my teenage sons for quite a while that the battle they will have to fight is the gap between rich and poor. The boss of Amazon growing richer uh, by millions of pounds a day is a case in point. How can humans ever evolve when this ridiculous situation exists? I believe in the free market, he says, but surely we can find a way to limit the amount of wealth one man can accumulate in a lifetime whilst his employees need food stamps. If Corbyn becomes our next PM and Sanders gets the Democratic nomination in the US race in 2020, then maybe this will indicate we are ready to make the first steps towards a more equal society. Otherwise, I feel that the increasing obscene wealth gap will eventually lead to civil strife as the working and middle classes are squeezed ever tighter. This extreme difference in wealth almost sets us apart as different species, not differentiated by colour or creed, 
but by our bank accounts. We will never meet these people, never interact with them, or ever by our labors get to challenge their wealth. Battle they will have to fight is the gap between rich and poor. Well, John, your teenage sons are lucky to have you as a father. Great wisdom there. And Chris says, why are the deep state playing around with world security like this and trying to start a global nuclear conflict with Russia? What possible gain? And Jack, sorry, David says, George, I fear ticket.com has crashed this evening. Your show is becoming too popular. Well, as uh, the late Duchess of Windsor once said, you can never be too rich or too thin and your show can never be too popular. But I take your point that Ticket.com has crashed due to the interview I gave with Lizzie from Gloucester, who, along with Tony X, the protest board, have founded an alternative to Twitter called Ticket.com. That's T-I-K-K-I-T. Now, I think the gutless coward is back. Yes, he is. Noticed you didn't read out my pro-Corbyn text. What? Or the 50th anniversary of the Soviets invading the Czech, so crushing freedom of speech, you gutless coward. <laughs> I never saw it, Mr. Gutless Coward. That's the pot calling the kettle black. A gutless coward who spends virtually an unlimited sum of money every Friday, listens to every word I ever speak on the radio, spends his wife's housekeeping money to text his hatred at me, calling me a gutless coward when he won't even put his name. Even a false name would do, gutless, so I could at least refer to it. He's calling me a gutless coward. I was explaining ticket.com is T-I-K-K-I-T dot com. Peter says, could the Scots get a land act? Well, it's a good point, Peter, because, of course, the Highland Clearances, a great crime committed against the Scottish people by Scottish landowners, where thousands were sent sailing across the Western Oceans to make way for sheep, a land act would be good. Uh, the redistribution of land to the Scottish people would be a very fine thing, but don't expect Nicola Sturgeon to introduce one any time soon. By the way, this is the anniversary. In 1305, Sir William Wallace, a great Scottish hero, was in East Central London, strangled, cut in two pieces, castrated, disemboweled, and then his innards were burned in front of his still open live eyes. That happened on this day in 1305. Now our man in Edinburgh is the comedian extraordinaire, John Maloney, comedy writer, stand-up comic of the very first rank. And he's been packing them in at the stand in Edinburgh at the Edinburgh Festival Fringe. And he's been good enough to spend five minutes with us every Friday to tell us what's hot and what's not. John, welcome. Hello, George. How are you? Pleasure to see you. I'm good, yeah. Have you had a good week again? Yes, we have. And also this final sort of long weekend, there's always packed houses because more people come up uh, and, and down for, for the bank holiday weekend. So, yeah, yeah all, all the... Uh, Edinburgh must be out. packed. It is. I mean, the, you know, the pavements are almost impossible. You know, they're, they're six people deep. But it's a real, it's a real thriving, you know, bustling city, especially at this time of year due to the festival. And as we've discussed before, the amount of tickets that, that shift are the third, the third after the Olympics and the, and the World Cup. I, you know, it's, I'll, it's I'll never get used. To, I'll never get used to that it, statistic. It's, it's, I really it, never it, will. It, it, I know it's it's it, it's a fact, and it's and it's a crazy fact. But it is because there are so many festivals going on at once you know and it has organically literally. grown hasn't it i mean as the yeah. name suggests this was a fringe in the beginning of the official yeah. edinburgh festival yes originally the 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 comedy here there's now 1300 shows this year originally the comedy it was it was on two sheets of a4 paper so there was about sort of 16 shows at the most wow. whereas now it's gone crazy and you have uh, comedy troops from all over the world you have 
student reviews. You have old men like me and Fred McCauley. <laughs> uh, you, you have the young comics. Um, and they just had the... Um, the sort of like the old the version of the Perrier these days these days and what it's called the Comedy Awards have they've been nominated uh, on Wednesday and there's five or six young comics including a tell great us who, who who's in the Larry running Dean. for that John well there's a great com- a young Scottish comic called Larry Dean who did a really good um, Life at the Apollo recently on BBC Two I think I think he's in he's in with the sh- shell well they all are really but then there's also a very good uh, comedian called Felicity Ward from Australia who also I, th- I think is excellent, and it, you know the only the only minor reservation I have about the nominees this year it's that if if you're forty and above you don't seem to exist in comedy yet that is when you're actually possibly well obviously by definition that you're most experienced and and you know and getting on with the job. Well, you're well, the I, living embodiment of, of that. <laughs> so uh, I mean, these six are chosen by whom? By journalists? Uh, yes, and uh, a couple of a couple of members of the general public. They have a panel. And the panel and the panel go and visit uh, shows that are eligible, and then they then they sit in in a room for a day and decide, you know, which which are the sort of I don't know if they're the best six, but but certainly six which reflect the festival itself. You know, where they have a couple of international acts, uh, you know, uh, generally somebody from the UK and and then maybe somebody from Australia or Canada, so they can sell it quite well at the other international festivals like Melbourne or Montreal. So. Uh, yeah, I mean, as I say, nothing against the acts of being nominated, but I wouldn't want to be 41 again. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, I alluded to this last time we spoke. Are there many Scottish people at the Edinburgh Festival? Uh, you broke up slightly there, but could you say that again, please? Yeah, I, I alluded to this last time we spoke. Are there many Scottish no, people? I've lost you. Ah, what a pity. Oh. John, can you hear me? Uh, sorry, George. Uh, I was asking if there are many Scottish people at the Edinburgh Festival. Oh, what a pity. We lost John for my final question. Uh, But thanks, John, for everything that you've done for us on the uh, festival reviews. X-Ray Vision says, Surely the US establishment can find another rap to bust a crook like Trump on because the Russian connection is proving to be non-existent. If anything, there was probably more collusion in the previous administration. We've got John back on the yeah, line. John. Yeah, we had uh, a dodgy line there for a second, but yeah, no, it's all good. I was just asking you, I alluded to this last week. Are there many Scottish people attending the Edinburgh Festival? Not that that matters all that much, because it's good for the Scottish economy that of so course. many visitors are coming in. But I just wonder, yeah, I culturally... I would say 70 to 80% of the people who come to the comedy are actually Scottish people. I think that, that thing's about right. There's a, a colleague of mine in the room now who's just nodded saying that sounds about right. That's interesting. That it's between, yeah. So three out of four are actually from, main, I think, mainly from Edinburgh. A lot of people come over from Glasgow. And, and you know, I think, I think anything within a kind of 50, 80-mile radius, really, people are coming in. Um, so, yeah, a lot of people. And, um, and it's, it's great. It's, it, it's, you know, the it venues sounds are so like busy. A, it sounds uh, terrific. Uh, yeah. And I'm really sorry that I didn't get up, especially to see your show, as you've been so kind in helping us uh, through the festival. Oh, no, it's, it, it's been a pleasure. And the, the, the venue I'm playing, uh, which is called The Stand, which is the regular club here on, on York Place. Has yeah, had, yeah, that's has the, the mecca, real, it's the real, mecca yeah, of comedy, yes. It is the mecca of, 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 of Edinburgh comedy, you're right. We've had some amazing people here, like Dylan, Dylan Moran's been here all all week, uh, Tony Slattery is doing his improv here at the moment, uh, and it, it, you know it, it really is a kind of A-list venue. So this, you know, it, it, it's been a delight to be associated with the people who are actually playing here themselves. So, so is this the last weekend, time. John? We, have, me and Fred finish on Sunday night. Some people finish on Monday, but Fred wants to get back over to Glasgow, and I, I'm I'm going back Tuesday morning. Well, anybody to, from London. Glasgow would like to get back to Glasgow from Edinburgh, but that's another <laughs> Very question. Very true. Do give Very him my true. best regards, uh, please, and uh, a big uh, well, thanks to you, John, oh, for no, uh, for all the help you've given us, and I know that listeners have found it really valuable. John Maloney, the great comedian and comedy writer who's on at the stand in Edinburgh for a couple of more nights uh, with Fred Macaulay, another legend of the Scottish comedy scene. Uh, But there are many, many more acts uh, still to see. So if you're anywhere near Edinburgh over this bank holiday weekend, do drop in to the Edinburgh Festival. Now this from Rafiq. Here I am near Central Park in Manhattan, listening to the reassuring voice of George Galloway 
on Talk Radio. People like myself on this side of the sullied pond and seemingly thousands globally are hungry for the truth. Thank you, King George, for airing it. Hashtag soaring. I can't tell you how gratifying that is that so many people around the world, as well as so many people here in Britain, are listening to this show. And one of the reasons is because there are regular legends on this show, and one of them is Norma. Norma in Bristol. Go ahead, Norma. Hello, George. Hi. Um, not many women callers tonight. No, not nearly enough. But no. you make up for the absence in part. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, as it's the Education of the Airways show, um, could you give a short explanation to me, I'm sure I'm not the only one, of the political system in America? Now, I know you've got the House of Representatives, you've got the Senate, um, it's, I suppose it's called Congress. Together it's called Congress, That's yeah. That's right, yeah. Now, which is the more democratic when passing laws and procedures and things like that? Just well, quick... they're, all, uh, they're all democratic. The U.S. has a democratic constitution. It's got far more democratic constitution than we do because, hey, we don't even have a constitution. And mm-hmm. Americans have uh, constitutional rights that are enshrined uh, in the constitution, and we don't because we don't have a constitution. (laughs) But of course, in practice, money has become king of the hill, uh, and those who put in the most money get most out of the system. The House of Representatives is much larger and is elected much more frequently, so every two years. So you're basically in a permanent election cycle for the House of Representatives, but not the Senate. The Senate is two senators from every state, The senators regard themselves, though not necessarily shared by the population, as princes, as a kind of royal court. And they have far more resource at their disposal because there are, by definition, far fewer of them. But in terms of dealing with Trump, uh, an impeachment motion would have to pass the House of Representatives with a two-thirds majority. I think Lee said earlier, three quarters, but I think it's two thirds. And then that motion would go to the US Senate, which would sit as a hundred person jury. And the House of Representatives would act as prosecutor. So they would prosecute a motion uh, passed by themselves and the Senate would decide uh, on the final outcome. In Mm. practice, what would happen if it reached that stage is that Trump would probably resign rather than face the ignominy of being actually Mm. impeached. Mm. But we'll have to wait and see. Sorry, that was shorthand, Norma. No, no, it's great. It's just very different from ours. And one little question. Um, Would you call the House a bit like our ordinary members of Parliament, and the Senate a bit like the House of Lords? Well, a little bit, but not quite. No. Um, the uh, House of Representatives is more representative than our House of Commons uh, because it's elected so regularly. And you'll recall the Chartists who created the movement for democracy in Britain had a demand for annual elections. Mm. Uh, and you've almost got that in the Congress because you've got at least biannual uh, elections. Uh, The House of Commons sits for five years, which allows people to ride out many a storm. Uh, And the Senate has more power, much more power, than our Uh, House of Lords. But you're right in this sense. The senators certainly regard themselves as lords. So that when I went (laughs) in front of the Senate committee, Mm. you'll remember, they were quite aghast at this commoner (laughs) speaking to them in that uh, that, manner. Thank you. Thank you, lovely Norma. Got to press on. Here's Mike in Bromley. Go ahead, Mike. Uh, Good evening, George. Evening, sir. Hi, how are you doing? Good, thanks. Been a good show tonight, I think. It's been been a great show. Big fan of yours. I called you... um, Many years ago in the older talk sport days. Uh, uh, those were the nice days. Things. I miss those days still, you know that? Well, uh, as long as you're back on talk radio, yeah. that's, uh, that's yeah. good enough for me. No, just uh, just just a quick point. Um, I'm not necessarily um, aligned to yourself in terms of your um, 
kind of well you know I, i'm not a socialist i have to say so probably unlike many of your listeners i'll probably describe myself as a, as a capitalist i suppose but i just wanted to come on and make the point that i think the kind of witch hunt uh on jeremy corbyn uh, who's um thoroughly decent man uh is is completely outrageous i mean i i I think it's it's terrible for democracy that the only kind of opposition that the mainstream media is proposing is to have these kind of uh, sort of social democrat left of centre. Yeah, yeah, people, two two cheeks. People. They want two yeah, cheeks. There is the opposition. It, it's it's just wrong. He's a thoroughly decent man. I I, I um I think it's outrageous. I I would never vote for the man. I I, I don't you know I, I probably unlike yourself and many of your listeners I wouldn't vote for him. But I respect him as an individual like yourself, as a, as a principled man. And it's really frustrating me that, this, this, that I see the mainstream media every day. It's so obvious, as you said earlier on the show, just trying to shoot him down. Uh, I, I hope it doesn't succeed. I don't think it will succeed. But I think it's bad for democracy, even though I'm not um, a fan of his politically. I, I just think, what can we do about it? My, my concern is that, you know, uh, I listen to your show every week. I watch your show on RT. I, I'm a big fan. I like everything you stand for, not necessarily uh, in terms of, like I said, every political view, but internationally on, on that stage in the Middle East, etc. I, I, I do agree. But, the, the, you know, the, the, you don't seem to be getting the platform you, you kind of need. I, I don't think anyway. So what my, well, my look, uh, I'll tell you what, what Mike, what can be uh, done? it's uh, it, it's most becoming uh, that you say so. Uh, in fact, noble. Uh, that you say so, um, and it's it's in the true democratic spirit that you speak, um, that you don't support our views, my views, Corbyn's views, uh, and yet not only defend our right to have them and be allowed to express them, but that you are aghast, as I think most right-thinking people are, mm -hmm. at the, I mean, Orwellian, it is literally Absolutely. Orwellian, uh, inversion of the truth. Black is white, night is day, war is peace, yeah. lies are truth. It is truly, uh, it, it's beyond anything the Orwell feared and satirized. Mm. And it would be the greatest tribute to uh, the British people if it didn't succeed. Now, that's not to say that Corbyn will be the next prime minister. It troubles me that so many uh, supporters of Corbyn imagine that the next election is a shoe-in, that he's definitely going in. He's not definitely going to win the election. He's not even yeah. necessarily definitely going to be the leader of the biggest party. And even if he was, he's got so many uh, of the fifth column behind him I think they'd do anything, including letting down his tires, uh, to stop him getting to the palace uh, to be uh, uh, appointed as prime minister. But all these are ifs and buts. What is deeply unhealthy for our society is if the only politics that is permitted is the two cheeks of the same backside politics. Exactly. Tweedledee, tweedledum. Because no, that's not, what we not, had before. It, it's not good for any of us. No, I agree, and 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 that's my point. You know, I, I believe in a, uh, a a fair fight with, with with differing views. I think we've got real problems, and it's like your point earlier on with with the social media. One of the first things I did when I was listening to your show earlier, um, I signed up for Ticket as well. What 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 a great idea! I've done that. It I, is I, a great I, idea, and it shows. I mean, no disrespect to Tony and Lizzie, mm. it shows how it can be done. Yeah. I'm not, I was going to say easy. Maybe it wasn't easy, no, but it's, it's been easy. done. <laughs> it's been done. We can create. the. This is the great value of the Internet, that exactly. the, we don't have to give money to Facebook and to Twitter. We, yeah, we can make our own. We can make a hundred more, uh, ten. We, we can. I, I, I hope so. I mean, may perhaps you're more uh, optimistic than me. I do find it a little bit depressing in a way um, that these private organisations are basically um, kind of running the show, running the agenda. Um, I, I hope that it, it, it's a turning point. Um, I, I don't know. Um, maybe you're up more optimistic than me. If we can do something, optimism um, springs fine. eternal in my breast, Mike. And especially <laughs> after talking with you, thank you very much Grand. for that call. Mike in Bromley.
Uh, David says there will be big protests in Ireland this weekend regarding Papa Frank's visit. Have you any thoughts or opinions about it? Well, I, I believe that Pope Francis is the finest pontiff that we have perhaps ever had since Peter. Uh, and uh, I think that the man is positively saintly. The church in Ireland has uh, a great many crimes uh, hidden under its bushel, and it's no surprise that significant numbers of people are still very angry about it. I was angry about one I read today about uh, uh, an orphanage that was run by the church in Lanarkshire in Scotland where some people have been arrested, including nuns, believe it or not, a 93-year-old nun. Uh, so I, I'm in no doubt that the church has many dark secrets uh, in its vaults. Uh, the pontiff has to uh, face these things and deal with them. But I believe in the Holy Roman Catholic and Apostolic Church. That's just my view. Georgie says, I've noticed on Twitter that lots of people are joining or rejoining Labour unless they're still suspended or expelled and there's some jolly good socialists in the wastelands, including your good self, George. Thank you, Georgie. Uh, I and Ken Livingston are the outsiders and we're appearing at St. George's Hall in Liverpool on the 18th of September. I hope people... Uh, sorry, the 8th. Ho, ho! The 8th of September, very soon indeed, less than two weeks away, and there's less than 100 tickets left. So if you're intending coming to hear the outsiders, better get your tickets quick. Fra says, I've heard some ex-ANC members recently, including Ronnie Castrells, decry the failures of the ANC in power, while others accuse it of mafia-type gangsterism and a campaign of terror and murders against black housing activists where did it all go wrong? Well, I don't believe that it all has gone wrong, but many things are not as good as they should be. Jem says, I absolutely agree the smears are a huge distraction to the atrocities that the government is carrying out on the most vulnerable in Britain. As for Sky News, they are reveling in the smears, and I don't believe a word from them on Brexit. It is quite funny. It was always the case that the uh, Rupert Murdoch's newspapers were pro-Brexit, yet Mr Murdoch's TV and his Times are doing their best to wreck Brexit. Not quite, quite sure what that's all about. Uh, Mal in Belfast says, George, furthermore, re last. Trump has painted a picture of Manafort that he's a great guy and it's a disgrace that he's paid for crimes going back 12 years and that he thinks it's great that Manafort stayed silent Maybe Trump is more worried about what's in his own no-show of tax returns. Let's hear from Andrew in South East London. Go ahead, Andrew. Oh, good evening, George. Evening, sir. Um, um, I wanted to uh, highlight McDonald's contribution that you had on earlier. He was wonderful, I thought, from the London School of Economics, yes. Well, I think there's something historic, uh, if you don't mind me saying so. I've been listening to the radio for over 60 years. And it's the first time that I can remember an African academic taking a dispassionate view of the historical uh, activities, whether, whether what was in my geography book or the ones that crept under the carpet, as it were, yes. of what was going on in the Commonwealth uh, in Africa under our jurisdiction. Yes. And and I, I wanted to compliment you, your, yourself and your production team on bringing McDonald to the air, because I think, A, I'd like to hear more from him. Yes, we're going to try and get him on my television show for next week, actually. I was so impressed by him. Well, well yes, but, but what, what impressed me so much was that he wasn't screaming the house down. No, no, he down. wasn't. In fact, he was rather more sceptical than me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> He was more he was more moderate than me with uh, despite having much more reason to, <laughs> to be angry. Well, well well precisely but I think that's because he's he's approached the subject through his uh, studies and Yes through, yes quite so through, it's a credit to him and it's a credit to the LSE. Uh, and and it's about time if you don't mind me saying so it's about time that people like McDonald are given the platform that that they deserve 
and we hear the truth about what what went on in our name. Yes. No, uh, it's uh, Africa itself is too little understood uh, in Britain, considering we owned a very substantial part of it that we took by force of arms, uh, that we denuded through slavery and through the exploitation of raw materials and commodities. Uh, we have a big part uh, in the African story, uh, and most of it bad. Um, and yet uh, the level of myopia uh, is demonstrated daily by such coverage as there is on the land question, not just in South Africa, but previously, perhaps even more hysterically, in Zimbabwe. Because I say that, Andrew, for this reason. Mrs. Thatcher promised in the Lancaster House Agreement that she would fund the land reform in newly independent Zimbabwe and then reneged upon that promise, thus mm -hmm. helping to exacerbate the problem of a poor, newly liberated country distributing land to its own people. Well, this is, this is my point, uh, George, that it's education which is, is the key to this. Through his education, MacDonald was able to cast a dispassionate view, and that's the only way you, people will really listen. Very good point, although Malema is pretty powerful as an orator. Uh, Andrew, I right. commend him to you. Uh, I, I, I would say this, and I'm sometimes said myself to be uh, an orator. Malema's speech at the funeral of Winnie Mandela was the most exhilarating speech I have ever heard in my entire life. Look it up on the YouTube. Uh, John is in Camden. Always a pleasure. John, welcome to the show. Good evening, George. How are you? I'm good, good. thanks. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about um, what the guy said earlier on when he was talking about um, possible impeachment proceedings for Donald Trump. Now, there's something that came up uh, today that the um, former chief financial officer of uh, Trump Incorporated, Alan Wieselberg, has been uh, given immunity from prosecution by federal officers because he will be testifying in front of a grand jury. Now, this guy is the guy that holds the purse strings to all of Trump's empire, basically. If there's anybody who knows about what money comes in and out of Trump Incorporated, it's him. So what I... what I kind of figure from this, and I'll, I'll, I've got the article in front of me here. It says, uh, and it's to do with a, and I'll scroll down here, um, Wieselberg was mentioned by Cohen on a secret recording uh, the lawyer made in which Cohen and Trump appeared to discuss reimbursing American media for hush money payment to former Playboy model Karen McDougal and adult film actress Stormy Daniels. So, yeah. I love that adult funny, film it? actress, don't you? Yeah. Ad adult, I wonder how much adult. acting was really going on. Well, yeah, adult adult film actress. Yeah, that's a, you know, a euphemism. Well, that does what, sound yeah. very portentous, uh, John, but uh, uh, far be it from me to defend Trump, but I'd have to make this point. What does all that have to do with collusion with Russia, which is supposed to be Mueller's task? Well, this, this, this I don't, I don't actually think that that this is to do with collusion with Russia per se. This is to do with inappropriate usage of um, campaign funds because uh, where the money came from, from what I can glean this particular article that's on VOA USA, and this is a uh, this has come from Reuters, that if the money kind of comes from basically Donald Trump's personal pocket, so to speak, to pay off Stormy Daniels to keep our gob shut, well, that's that's his business. But if it but if it but if it comes out of campaign funds, well, then that's improper usage. Yeah, no, of yeah. course I can see that, and I could see why that would be potentially a crime. But 
it's this issue of fishing expeditions, isn't it? Uh, if you set up a special prosecutor to specifically investigate the allegation of Russian collusion in the election of Donald Trump, then whether he gave money to an adult film actress to, as you put it incomparably, keep her gob shut, uh, is totally irrelevant to the uh, task which Mueller has been empowered to carry out. Um, Duffy, it, 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 but, but what, what I'm still unsure of here is that is the payment to adult film actresses by the President of the United States enough to gain impeachment? Uh, well, personally, I doubt that. You see, um, first of all, most rich and powerful people in the United States would not be able to stand the scrutiny for five minutes that Trump has now been put under and Trump's aides have now been put under. There cannot be a rich man in America who is not somewhere in, their, in the innards of their business affairs committed such offences. And there's probably very few of them have not lain down with an adult film actress or someone else of that ilk. Um, and I, I'm not sure that that is an impeachable offence. Uh, people break campaign finance law in the United States with virtual impunity, all politicians in all elections. This is supposed to be about whether the Russian government colluded with the Trump campaign to defeat Hillary Clinton in the presidential election. And I'm with Stranahan on this. I still haven't seen a scintilla of evidence of that central charge. And that's the charge, the only charge, that Mueller has any power to uh, unearth and bring forth. Brilliant. Well, that's, that's, that's basically putting it in to context. So what, what, what all this is is doing is, as you say, it's like a fishing expedition. Yeah. But, um, but basically, then Donald Trump can do what he likes. If, if, if it's a, if he's, if he's like paying off people that he's had an affair with, well, that's between him and his lady wife. That's kind of nobody else's business, and isn't really anything that he could be impeached for I, I, I really yeah, don't I really don't think so because it would open up for every politician in America uh, the possibility of deep state investigation of their campaign funds and I don't think they'll do that John's pleasure as always to talk with you uh, I've only got a few minutes left uh, Richard says brilliant advice to Scott George, uh, be true to yourself. I believe, like you, Corbyn tries hard to follow that mantra, as do I. What a pity the Blairites don't follow that advice. And Phil Nielsen says, your American guest is full of it. He's just spreading QAnon garbage propaganda. One, the U.S. president can only pardon someone who has committed U.S. federal crime and not state or local crimes. Two, there's a reason KKK around the world support Trump. And this one is from Eddie in Islington. George, I'm 73 now, still buying the Daily Mirror every day for over 50 years except Sunday. I realize I should be in Ward 5. <laughs> it's trying to outdo the sun virtually over the past two years or much more continued barrage of propaganda against Russia and demonization of Putin. That is highly unlikely. On the 24th of April 2018, the Daily Mirror by Andrew Gregory said that Russia poses a grave threat to the world order, says Minister Penny Mordaunt, and Putin veto is a green flag to evil Assad. I just picked this one out because it's blatant fake news and lightweight reporting. Well, Daily Mirror, fake news, lightweight reporting, some mistake surely. Bob Justice says comparisons with Corbyn and Trump are obviously nonsense but there are comparisons to be made with the Trump investigations and those of the Remain camp. 
both have had outside influence over the vote mooted and both have looked into financial irregularities. And Free Dumb says, George, can you please give your thoughts on the news that a further 25 children have been killed today in Yemen by the Saudi-led coalition? The UN humanitarian chief confirms today. I don't know the story. Uh, I will look into it. But it's dismal news indeed. David says, George, are you kidding about Andrew Neil? He is a right-wing establishment figure. He sickens me. Well, he is a right-wing establishment figure. He wouldn't be in the position he's in if he wasn't. He just doesn't sicken me, David. Marie says, Jeremy Vine taking a pay cut, moving from the BBC to Channel 5 to take over the right stuff starting on Monday. Does this mean Ian Wright is the new question time presenter? What's going on? We need to hashtag change the media. I don't think Jeremy is moving from the BBC. I think he intends to do both. I'll need to check that out. Jeremy Vine, who lost his father this week, and I sent him my condolences uh, over that matter, is actually one of the very few people in the BBC worthy of their salt, just not £700,000 a year's worth of salt. And Hedy says, George, would you be interested in an, un an upcoming vacancy at Old Trafford? Scottish managers seem to do well there. Hedy, that is the best idea I have heard in a long, long time. And I have supported them since 1964, long before Fergie. I could do a job at Old Trafford. I tell you, I watched that documentary on City. I don't know what Marini's, Mourinho is talking about. Looked like pure class to me, and I'm no fan of Manchester City. It's been marvellous for me. I hope it was for you, and if it was, come back next week at the same time and bring someone else with you. It's already evident that our audience is swelling and swelling and reaching other shores, Australasia and the United States, Hong Kong and elsewhere in Asia. The worldwide reputation of the Open University of the Airwaves is growing thanks to you. <laughs>